So should I look towards the cameras or towards Emily? Towards Emily. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you're having a conversation with her. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful. Ready? Camera one rolling. Two rolling. Seven. You just uh, scooch it to your. Yeah, there you go. Right there. And download it. Perfect. All right. Interview two, take one. Now the usefulness of fashion is historic, is, is in hindsight, not so much in the exact present moment. It's a form of self-expression and self-identity and you can really um, just use it as an extension of yourself and outward facing. You know, when people see you, they kind of see your clothing first almost. Um, so it's a way to kind of define yourself. In recent years, I've started to look more closely at fashion as sort of a lens of anthropology, of history, it has social history. It sort of incorporates so many of the preoccupations that we have as a society, for better or for worse, at a moment in time. I think fashion is kind of just a form of self-expression, um, especially style. It's a different way of like presenting yourself towards others um, by what you wear. You look at some of the greats from fashion history, including Kristen Dior and um, Christabel Balenciaga. Both of them spent an enormous amount of time in fashion archives actually studying 19th century construction techniques in order to learn from those pieces. But then they took those works or those efforts and translated them into their own time, making something new and fresh. I am a branding lawyer. I have an industry specialization in fashion law, uh, which is great, love it. And uh, my law firm, so I was on Bay Street for 10 years, fast track to partner within six, and then got tired of the whole constraints of Bay Street and launched my own firm, Froze Law, about 18 months ago. My scope of practice, trademarks, copyright, domain names, social media, marketing and advertising, packaging, labeling, and commercial agreements. I work with consumer-facing branded product services and talent to help them uh, to create their concepts and make them into viable businesses from a legal standpoint. Fashion law is a construct of different areas of law, but really it's having an industry know-how and knowledge and applying the laws to the industry in a business savvy way. Intellectual property law, commercial, corporate, tax, real estate, e-commerce for example, these are all uh, types of law that exist, but when you apply it to the fashion industry, it's understanding the behind the scenes, the dynamics, the business rationale, the business nuances, so you can apply those laws in a more effective manner. Like any art form, um, you know, like writers put, and any kind of artists or creators or anything like that, you put a lot of time and effort into making something, um, and that's just important to get recognized for it. Both designers and artists take inspiration from various places, whether it's real life or what people are wearing on the street. Um, other works of art, artists have long history of copying other artists' work as a process of learning. I think that there's quite a distinction in learning from greater people from the past or, or the greats of the past and, and sort of making that process of replication as a part of your learning process. 
but then taking it and changing it, making it new, making it fresh, um, that is also a very um, important part of sort of the development of a designer. You know, Karl Lagerfeld did that in Chanel and kind of looking at what Gabrielle Chanel herself um, was using as a signature of house of the house and then reinventing it. And so there is a tradition of copying, so to speak, but the difference between copying um, for inspiration and the difference between copying for monetary reasons or laziness are quite distinct. What always intrigues me and continues to sort of puzzle me a little bit because I sort of have come out the other side of the argument, but I, there, I still have really emotional responses to copying, um, as many people do, is the idea that it's sort of at this intersection. It's artful commerce and it's utilitarian. Clothing is utilitarian. So kind of working through that puzzle of why it is that I and so many others have such a visceral reaction to what is clear over inspiration. And yet it's not necessarily rational if you really unpack all the arguments around intellectual property and whether they actually benefit creators in the long run or not. So there's three statutory types of intellectual property law protection, patent, trademark, copyright, sorry, four, and industrial design. Added on to that, there's contractual kind of intellectual property called trade secrets. So there's five foundations of intellectual property. All of them are going to be applicable depending on what the business is. So copyright protection exists for original designs and in the IP world, original has a lower threshold for protection. However, if you manufacture that utilitarian article 50 times or more, you still have rights to it, but anybody can copy it and manufacture it itself but then there's exceptions to that so it's a layered approach and then there's exemptions to the exemptions of the right cool. what ends up happening if you if, if everyone hoards these sort of ideas is that you have a number of corporations that are have a huge vested financial interest in main, in maintaining and lobbying for the extension of copyright and for the extension of character rights if you're thinking disney and who have the money to litigate uh, against all the people who don't have the money to litigate or to copyright their designs. Okay, so the fashion research collection at Ryerson consists of about 3,000 garments and accessories that uh, demonstrate the history of fashion. This particular Mercy jacket uh, represents an important moment in fashion history in that it was a rare example of uh, an object of fashion that was copied and then subject to a legal suit. The, the Mercy jacket, which is like my infamous moment, I guess my one kind of weird scoop. This is how it pays to sort of do really granular. I was a beat reporter for many years and that meant going into the designer studios and seeing them as they worked on their collections and in a really granular, micro-local way. So I was really familiar with designs from Toronto, say, or from Montreal or Vancouver. A year after, in 2009, um, I noticed in Teen Vogue and then in Elle and then in a number of other places, a jacket that looked a lot like, not just a, a jacket that I had covered that was from the spring of 2008, but that I had personally purchased because I put my money where my mouth is and I actually shop from those people. Um, and so I contacted Mercy to see if they had perhaps either licensed it or were aware of it. And then um, they didn't have the, a copy of the jacket anymore because they didn't have their sample. I did. And then um, I went and got a D Diane von Furstenberg jacket, which was sort of the end of the season. So that was hard to do. And just compared them as engineering blueprints next to each other. And they were with the exception of, you know, one is was, hand, was sewn at a contractor in Toronto and all the care that that implies. And one was sewn with, you know, more mass market linings and with a little less care, but certainly they were virtually the same. The thing to understand about the Mercy jacket though is, and I think this is a really important point to remember, is that Mercy will be the first to tell you that that jacket was based on 
not a specific pattern for, but certainly the idea of a 1930s bed jacket, which is a, you know, nothing in fashion is ex nihilo. Like this coat that I'm wearing, you know, people would say, okay, well, it's sort of based in Victorian time, kind of the, the top of it. And then the, the ruffles are, you know, 17th century. It's sort of a remix of things. So I think that's important to remember that it's not like they came up with this idea out of nothing. So the Mercy Jacket now lives in the Ryerson Fashion Collection, partly because I spent months and months on this story and I just never wanted to wear it again. It was, you know, I'd lost my taste for it. And I also felt it was important as an example of this particular debate. It wasn't so much at the time that I was out for blood on the copyright and piracy issue. It's that Deanne von Furstenberg, as uh, at the time she was still very active at her company and oversaw a design team of about 15 people, was the head of the Council of Fashion Designers of America. And I felt it was really important to call out, to lay out the, the fact that she was campaigning for this and there was a deep hypocrisy when in her own firm they had clearly done exactly what she was being so vocal about on Capitol Hill. Trademarks protects a brand, so it doesn't matter if you have just a simple logo. This is going to be applicable to every business out there, so it could be your Nike or your Just Do It. But when you get into um, more sophisticated types of strategy of protecting, it can go into non-traditional trademarks, which is where it gets very interesting, especially when you're dealing with consumer-facing branded product services and talent. Because what is a t-shirt? Just a plain t-shirt. Slap on a Nike swoosh and the retail value goes up exponentially. Is it a better product? Not necessarily. And so when you're dealing with um, industries that are highly saturated in terms of other competing products, it's oftentimes the brand that's going to set you apart because the brand is the beacon to bring the consumers with you. Christian Louboutin was able to protect the bottom soles, the red color of it, and claim that they had proprietary rights to that. Copyright protection is definitely something that is applicable as well, but there's nuances and it's a very um, academic, complicated type of legislation where there is protection, but there's caveats and there's exemptions and there's exemptions to exemptions. So it happened in the States, it happened in uh, New York State, and it was fascinating because it's rare that large companies in the fashion industry go up against each other and go all the way to trial and all the way to appeal. Vast majority of cases, not just within the fashion industry, but generally, they all settle. So what was fascinating is that we could really go through all of the documents that they submitted and the evidence that they submitted. So it was very interesting. The crux of the situation was that Christian Louboutin, as you probably know, has red bottom soles. They become very well known uh, with that. Um, Yves Saint Laurent came out with years ago, like five or six years ago, something like that. Uh, one of their seasons, they had shoes that were yellow shoes with yellow bottom soles, uh, blue with blue bottom soles, green with green bottom soles, red with red bottom soles. Christine Louboutin took issue with that. They have trademark registrations. They claim that they had exclusive proprietary rights. Christine Louboutin sued Yves Saint Laurent. Yves Saint Laurent came back and said, well, no, you don't have exclusive rights. This is not novel to you. This isn't proprietary to you, and it's not distinctive to you. In fact, they even brought in uh, pop culture references, such as Dorothy from Wizard of Oz. So they even looked at her. She was a big part of pop culture, what, 50 years ago or so. Her character was, and those shoes were iconic. So Yves Saint Laurent came back and said, actually, no, we're going to counter Sue and say that you don't have any rights at all and strip you completely. So it was interesting because then the trial judge took a view that was a bit patronizing to the fashion industry. He said, no company in the fashion industry can claim rights to a color. It's not right. And he said it would be like Monet saying that he's the only artist that can have blue. But when a woman is walking down the street and you see red bottom shoes, the women will know this, maybe the men will too, do you, what do you think of automatically? Hey, oh my God, those are amazing shoes. Aren't they? Louboutin. Christian Louboutin. And the whole function of trademarks is that if it's distinctive in the mind of the consumer, that when they see this, they associate it with that brand, that's a trademark. That's the whole purpose of it. So 
Uh, the first decision, Christian Louboutin did not fare well, and they appealed it because it's New York, it's a big deal, the American economy, it's worth investing in the legal because it's such a consumer society. So they appealed it, and what ended up happening was essentially it was kind of like a court-mandated coexistence agreement. And what the court ended up saying, the appeal court said, was that we agree that Christian Louboutin has rights to the red bottom soles. But in all the evidence that we see and in the marketplace evidence, we see Christian Louboutin black shoes, tan shoes, gold shoes, um, silver shoes. We always see it with the red bottom, but we never see red with red, which is actually true. I've never, I've never come across that. So the appeal court said, yes, absolutely, you have exclusive rights to it, but only as it relates to shoes that are not red, that have a different color on the actual shoe. And so in that instance, Yves Saint Laurent was found to not be guilty because it was red with red. I think the shame part is really important to think about. I'm still puzzling over where that comes from. And I mean, the shame, I mean, you know, if you look at the tone of when people, whether it's the fashion law or diet Prada, I think a week or two ago, very recently, um, Christian Siriano was sort of shamed into removing a design from production that was too similar to something that was a Valentino look from a year or two ago. Which again, Valentino's not making that anymore, so it's not harming the, the originator, if you want to call Valentino the originator. He, he or as the brand is not producing that, so it's not an opportunity cost for that. But also there's this whole idea of authenticity that we're really emphasizing now. And we're, I think it's a lot of the arguments get flattened out and become really glib and I think the more you know about fashion and clothing and costume history, the more when you look at these, you see, yes, maybe they are perhaps too similar, but that in fact, you know, Jean Galliano can, can claim whatever, but then he's just, you know, ripping off Westwood, who's then just like ripping off 19th century dress. It makes me unpopular among the many designers who are now my friends and among the creative community that I am one of the dissenting opinions and pretty vocal about the fact that I don't think intellectual property rights in fashion design are possible. The idea of utilitarianism is at the root of why it's not possible. Whether you identify the primary function as artful or useful, and I really fall on the side of clothing is useful. It's a coat. It performs a function. And I think it also inhibits creativity fundamentally because um, unless you kind of prove that it's a perfectly novel idea, like a pair of black trousers with two pleats and a pocket on the left-hand side would just go to the largest company that could, you know, rush to register and then suddenly hoard and own all of these things. And so then you have someone like a Ralph Lauren where there's, I think, a garment or an item by Ralph Lauren is sold every 90 seconds somewhere in the world, basically owning every idea and no one can make anything. When any law is created, any kind of legislation, it's the government is doing, is trying to create a purpose for it. And what's the underlying rationale? With intellectual property laws, the government is saying that it will reward you. And it will reward you by giving you a monopoly. So if you get a trademark registration, you can use that trademark countrywide and you have exclusive rights. The, they all have different reasons for doing it. I mean, pharmaceutical is different from you know, fine art, which is different from photography. But, but if you really look at the reasons that exist, you understand that it's actually not adversarial to the designer. In the, but you just have to take a long view and a general view, and that's why you can't be personal about it. That's a really hard place to be, because it is an emotional response. I have an emotional response when I see Bonnie Cashin's work, you know, down to the wire, copied. I think that, unfortunately, uh, sometimes creatives don't take the necessary steps to really protect their designs, and there's a misconception that they can't protect it because law is not intuitive and they haven't read the legal textbooks and um, they may not know. So knowledge is power, first of all. Um, and then I think also there's the economics of business as well. So large multinational conglomerates will have deep pockets to be able to enforce and uh, they'll have a sort of pot set aside for settlement of claims against them, etc. I think also when you're dealing with fashion law, uh, to some extent it's challenging to protect all of, uh, all of the designs and nuances and not every country has the same kind of legislation that would be very applicable to protecting fashion designs. I think there's also a concept of you can be a creative, 
but you also have to be business savvy and you have to understand that your greatest asset, corporate asset, will be your creative designs. So the whole concept of intellectual property is that it protects creativity, it allows you to commercialize creativity and enforce it. Is it always the best? Are there nuances that could be approved upon? Of course, no system's ever perfect. But from what I've seen, I do believe that the intellectual property laws in Canada are quite robust. I think that there's um, a lack of education on the part of the designers on how they can use that type of IP to better protect themselves. We're in the middle of this sort of remix culture moment that we weren't in 10 years ago. And it's the case with music, you know, sampling and, and how much is fair use and how much is not. And, um, and music is just an, you know, like writing is just putting notes in a certain order or words in a certain order. And it's very hard to separate that when we put fashion as an art to understanding that putting stitches in a certain order isn't the same thing. Take a step back and think about what um, the industry norms are and what they have always been. And there has always been the Paris dress with your dressmaker in the 19th century that then people would, would not copy but would emulate and have iterations of to the degree that they could afford it. So they could afford a slightly less perhaps a uh, skilled uh, seamstress or a dressmaker and the fabric might be of less quality or there might be fewer embellishments. But there has always been that sort of metabolism within the industry of fashion for everyone to kind of follow the prevailing trends. And so when you get to something like, why is this on the runway right now and they're copycats, you think, well, let's take a look at the metabolism of ap like the appetite that we have. I think we have to sort of step back and think about what clothing really is.